My very special guest, and what a guest I've got for you tonight. This guy is a national institution, one of the best on the planet. Nobody even competes in the world. And Mr. Bobby Davro, good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening to you. Yes, it's him. It's Bobby Davro, still alive at the Apollo. And we like it, we like it, we like it. 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 Right, you're re- what are you rehearsing for, Bob? Well, I'm doing lots of different things. I'm, do- I'm writing material at the moment. I'm oh. doing a bit of writing for Stephen Malhern, the musician. Well, what, um, what, 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 what kind of made you turn yourself into this unique star, Bobby Davro? Who, who were you watching back in the day? What was going on? What made you decide that? <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm, pl- I'm going to plug you in here because I'm down to 4% you're talking, you're talking to me on my... My funny old mo- mobile. Right, I'm with you. Well, that will be interesting tonight. Bobby Davro on 4%, ladies and gentlemen. Well, actually, how weird is that? I am actually on 4%, but I've just plugged you in. So you're fully, as Dr. Professor Brian Cox would say, it's amazing how much power that you can get from the mains here, 240 volts. Travel at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. Bob, 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 is this is this how you are all the time? Just like this, yeah, all the time. It's tonight, it's tonight because actually I'm on my own and I've been rehearsing. I've been singing tonight. I've been doing some uh, some stuff, um, and I've had three jacks. I know it sounds terrible because we're talking about drinking. I'm not an alcoholic. Just like everyone keeps going. We saw you on a TV show and it looked like you were an alcoholic. Ah. I'm not an alcoholic. I can get, I've given up loads of times. Oh, <laughs> well, well, wonderful! Uh, when did when did you start your television debut? Can you remember when that was, Bob? Nineteen eighty one. Wow! I think the first thing I did, which was up for the cup, which was a program done in the Midlands, and then I did um, what else did they? And then I did things. Then I had a big break. I did um, live at Her Majesty's. Oh yes, yes, of course. Which was a huge show. I came on as Freddie Freddie Stone. Do you, do you remember Freddie? He was, he, was just, uh, silly, uh, he was the funniest man I've ever seen. He was the funniest man I've ever seen. And um, I did him, and then I did a bit of Cliff, and then I, I um, sat at the piano and did uh, singing impressions. I did a bit of Elton, and I did a bit of B- Billy Joel. I'll do a bit for you now. <laughs> it's nine o'clock, and it's 9.30ish. On a th- uh, what day is it? Friday, Friday. night. <laughs> Christmas phone, you up on the phone, nigga. I sound a bit, I sound a bit fuzzy, don't I? It's only because I've been rehearsing. I, you know, I actually, to be honest with you, I completely forgot about this radio interview. So you've caught me in a good, good, good frame of mind. You forgot about me tonight. You forgot. Yeah, I didn't forget about you, but I didn't realise the time. Well. Listen, I want to talk a little bit about copycats on the show tonight. You were involved with copycats. What a fantastic program that was. Do you miss that? They were the days, weren't they? Yes, they were. I miss, I miss variety. I miss the. I miss the, the kind of humour, the sketches. I mean, now a lot of them. I, actually, my daughter. I have a seventeen-year-old. She came home the other day. Oh, I said she was effing this, effing that, effing this, effing that. Sort of swearing. That was the exam results. She. Um, I'll let you pause for laughter. Carry on. I'll. Um, she said to me, she said, you've got some shows on TV that have been put on the YouTube. And so I said, oh, I, I'll have a look at those. And one of them was copycat, but you wouldn't be able to do the sketch that they showed because it was racist. You know, it, was, it was then, back then, it was sort of the norm, but now you can't do that kind of material. You know? uh, and it was quite shocking to see what we were doing back then, you know, compared to what is happening now. Yeah, but, you know, you go back and talk about those days. Love Thy Neighbour was out on the buzzies, was around at that time, wasn't it? Yes, because it was, it was accepted there, you know. So to look back and, and see someone and judge someone, what the material they were doing back then, and say, oh, you were racist for me, and, well, we were all racist for, for laughing at it. But now it's not acceptable. So if you were to do that kind of stuff now, obviously it, would be, it wouldn't be right. So you could be aware of that. So when when did you get your first TV break on your own? When because you know I was watching some of your stuff the last couple of days, some hilarious stuff. When did you get your first break on your own by yourself? Well, from copycats, I think if I may say myself, and I don't mean this in a, in a, an arrogant or big-headed way, I think it was because I was the guy out of the team. We had great impressions on. We had Johnny Moore, sadly, who's gone. 
lovely, lovely man. He was a great professionist. Uh, we had AJ Harvey. We had Alan Stewart. We had um, who else did we have? We had uh, Gary Wilmot, who has been my friend for all that time, and Les Dennis, who was my, probably my best friend in show business. Um, we were a team. That the, what, what I, I, I think they saw in me was the fact I was always very original. Mike Yarwood was my hero back then. Um, and I remember when I was 16, I wrote him a letter. I was on Opportunity Knots. I had an audition for Opportunity Knots. Yeah. And he wrote me a lovely letter back, which I've still got in a, in a, in a, uh, you know, in a frame, for the frame, saying just be original and be yourself. And, and Mike Yarwood now, he lives very locally to me, and I'm, I'm, I still go out with him sort of maybe every, every six months. We go down to Sunbury and have a curry, and we talk about impressions and the glory show business days of variety. But he put me right, and he said, you've got to come up with some original stuff. And I was an original, uh, I was the impressionist of the day, I guess. Yes. So I'd still be Norman Norman Wisdom, and Finn Spencer, and all that, and Toby Cooper, Farrow. I did all, all sort of strange impressions. I did sort of Alex Higgins and Max Edrin, and a lot of people on Channel 4, uh, <laughs> like um, <laughs> Jonathan oh. King, and, and Jules Holland, for instance. I was the very first person to do Jules Holland, and this house did it. And it, it was... <laughs> And it was something that I pride, prided myself in, trying to be different. And different is the most important thing. Well, it, well, it is. And one of the things that I remember, of course, because I, I am a big fan, as I've told the audience, I'm a big fan, Bobby Davro on the box. Yeah, um, we did some good stuff. I'll tell you who was my director. Well, the first director I had was a guy called John K. Cooper, who had worked with um, the great Stanley Baxter, and then Russ Abbott. Uh, and then he took me over and um, took me down to TVS. I went down to Southern Television. Uh I would have liked to have been in London Weekend, really, to be truthful with you. But I did six series, I think, at t- TVS. And we had some great years. And then Nigel Lithgow came and directed for me, great Nigel Lithgow. Uh, he he was nasty Nigel, you know, in, I think, was it Pop Idols or, or the, one of those music shows. Uh, and he was the most inventive. He was a, a choreographer, a very famous choreographer. And he was, um, he was so inventive. And we were doing split cameras and split and blue screen and stuff. I remember doing one uh, thing I did for a special down there, which was an Easter show, and we, we did, I did all the modern, at the time I was doing Ben Elton, oh, I'd be right there, I'd be, and I was doing Ben Elton, and Zoom Bowen, and, and Alex Higgins, and other Alex Higgins, and, and oh. it was, um, and it made it into the most wonderful show, and he was so clever, and I was sort of doing pop, all the people around then, that I was doing pop impressions of, like Elton, and George Michael, and, and the people of the day, and uh, it was so, it was such a creative time of my life and that's what I miss from television I miss having the ability to be creative anymore on on a on a program where I could show you that I still am creative no, you are professional. you are never stood still. you are see see the thing is Bobby you know I've kind of grown up with you uh, and I've seen all, and, and recently I've seen you in stuff which we'll talk about in a while. But I've seen you in stuff recently. You are a very, very naturally gifted, funny comedian, stroke actor as well. Some things that you've acted in comedy scenes on your programs were the most hilarious things. And I think a lot of the stuff that's been out recently have been robbed from shows like you used to do back in the eighties. Yes, I suppose so. It goes around, comes around. I don't actually. The, the fact that people may say, oh, we have an 80s entertainer, it's washed up. I'm certainly not washed up. No. And anyone that comes to see my live shows um, will realise that I'm still working. I, I do. I tell you the best advice I ever got. You remember catchphrase? Yes. Well, Roy Walker, I went to see Roy Walker in, uh, in um, Eastbourne at the Congress Theatre. And I was just starting, I was about 19. And I went down there, and he came out, and he did his... He was on The Comedian, the new comedian. And I saw this guy walking. He was a great comic. And I went backstage and met him. Hello, Mr. Walker. You can call me Roy. I said, can I just say how fantastic that set was? And he went, that's great. And, and what are you doing? I said, well, I'm an impressionist. I do, you know, kind of pop my way in comedy. And I said, have you got any tips? And this is what he said to me. He said, Bobby, said, just do an hour a day, Bob, an hour a day. And do you know what? I'm 60 years old now. And so that's 41 years ago, he told me that, and I still work an hour a day at it. And I still try and do contemporary stuff. I, I don't want to be viewed as an old-fashioned performer. My style is old-fashioned. I'm a gag man. But I'm not an old-fashioned uh, 
comic. No, you're not. I'm, I'm contemporary thing, you know. No, you're not. I mean, there, there's so many things that you've been involved with. You've done copycats. You've done the sketch pad. Um, which, which, which is another great show of mine. Then you slipped over to the BBC to do a show called Public Enemy Number no. One. What was that about? Well, that wasn't a good place. Uh, I was doing that on a Sunday. We were recording during the day. I was doing a summer season in Blackpool. Uh, it's not for me to sort of put the blame onto anyone else. It wasn't well directed or produced. And it didn't really work. The format wasn't great. Um, but, you know, it could have been a bit better. I didn't spend the time, or well, I couldn't spend the time simply because I was doing the summer show up in Blackpool. Yeah. And it was thrown together a little bit. But I tell you who did very well out of it was Dale Winton, love him. Oh, bless, oh, him. bless him. And he was, my, he, he was my sort of sidekick. And he went on to do Supermarket Street. He went on to be a, a very popular um, entertainer. A wonderful man he was. So sad to have lost him. Yeah, it's uh, uh, again, so Dale Winton, somebody else, of course, being up here in, uh, in Birmingham in the West Midlands. I remember Dale from the days of Beacon Radio back then. Um, but you've but there's so there's so many things that you've done. Of course, you've moved channels. You've done different things. And somebody else that, that won't know this, of course, somebody who is still broadcasting on a shopping TV channel as we speak. Somebody else you work with, Peter Simon. Yeah, lovely Peter, Captain Custard. Ah, oh, bless. We, we all did two series of Run the Risk after Shane Ritchie uh, left. I took over and, and did Run the Risk with Peter, and I, again, a lovely fella. And we had lots of laughs. And this is a great, great story for you. Now, you know the big trough of guns yes. that the kids used to get pushed into? Yes. At the beginning, they'd, 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 put, they'd fill it up on a Monday, and then they'd, they'd be shooting all, all day, twice, two shows a day, all the way through the week. And by Friday, this stuff was rancid, absolutely rancid. But they, wouldn't, they couldn't be bothered to take it all out and put some new stuff in. They just oh. used to mix it in, and kids oh. were falling in there and throwing up. There was <laughs> little and carrots and all sorts of things. Dreadful. And... And I had a great time doing that too. I really enjoyed that. That was one of the things which I enjoyed. Of course, I was a young man looking at it now. I look back and I see myself in my twenties. You know. It's, well, uh, well, I, I yesterday, I yesterday on my social media shared uh, a full episode because I took it from uh, a TVS link uh, for yes. one of your shows, and the response was amazing because I think the opening scene was you. Uh, going to kind of burglar house and using a cash card on the door, and then cash came out the letterbox, which I thought was just hilarious. It was kind of you done it in a way. It was I'm not I don't need to burglar. You just pass the cash through the. It was just so funny. Uh, what was I it? I don't watch it. I don't watch sort of anything on the TV or on YouTube. I find it slightly like listening to yourself talking. There's certain things I will watch that I'm very proud of. Yes. Um, and there's things that I won't watch. Like oh gosh, is that really me? When I see myself as such a young man, a lot of it's now slightly dated, I would imagine. No, not at all. TV shows. Well, some, but some of the impressions, you know, I was doing Jonathan King and, and um, I was doing all the pops, Sade and, and Bross, because Bross are making a comeback, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who else did I do? Oh, uh, Anita Tikara and people like that. But the best singing impression, people don't know we sing, it's that we've always been a vocal act. You know, but 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 the, but the, th- the thing is, this is this is what's important for the audience. Of course, those that are listening now, all across the world, listening to this show live now, uh, you've had such an amazing career, and the, there's so much relevancy still uh, that goes on with yourself. I mean, you've, you, we're going to talk about your acting side in a minute, but around all this that you're doing, you then decided to take over Tarby's job and get involved with Winner Takes All. Why did you decide to do that? Well, again, that was I think that was a TVS. Uh... I think it was TVS, Dan Maidstone, and they just wanted a host. And I actually, we called it Winner Takes, I won't say the word, we take, Winner Takes Boggle. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I know what you was going to say then, I know what you was, I'm so glad you didn't. <laughs> yeah, we don't use the F word, that terrible word, like, of uh, 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 funny. And we, we did it, and I actually did a lot of graft with that. I had a friend of mine, do you know who wrote for me on Run the Risk, believe it or not, it was one of the writers, was David Williams. No way. Yeah, David used to come in and, and we used to try and get these things. If you look at some of the, the, the Christmas specials, I think they're on the YouTube. And uh, a friend of mine, funny enough, who, who goes out with the daughter of my girlfriend, Phil Butler, lovely comic, um, he, he dressed up as a gorilla. And we looked back at the at the um, TV and we looked at him to be, I interviewed him as a gorilla. And it gave me an idea to do David Attenborough. And now I did that, I've reinstated my David Attenborough impression. Uh, which includes a gorilla coming on the stage. It's, <laughs> oh. It was so funny. But 
He was the he was the gorilla. And you look back, you see things. I tell you one of the best things I got. A guy sent me a picture to be signed. <coughs> I wanted an autograph. And he sent me a picture taken off the internet. And it was me sitting on a revolving chair, on a like an office chair. And then I was about it was it was taken from a a warm up that I did for one of my TV shows. And I you know, obviously I can't remember what I did all those years ago. But I was looking in, I think, what am I doing in that, that chair? And then I looked at the glass I had some glasses. And then I remembered, and what it was, I was doing an impression of Michael Parkinson interviewing different people. Yes. And as I, I went, it's my man Parkinson, it's an idiot, it's my special guy, it's Michael Kidd. And I spun round on this chair, and I put some glasses on, good evening, bad old fuck, okay. And I spun round and go, hello, darling, stay with me, love it. So I thought, this is a great way, and this is what I was good at. I used to find different ways of presenting impressions routines. So I didn't just stand there and do one voice after the other after. I had to find a vehicle to make it look a bit different. And the, the and that was a particular I took that idea and I'm now working. I mean I did something that was slightly on PC. I actually thought who sits in a chair? I mean, obviously uh, Graham Norton, for instance, you know. <laughs> so I could do Graham Norton, I could do Jonathan Ross, which I ain't done for a long time. Jonathan Ross oh. and uh, and uh, oh Alan Carr, of course Alan Carr, he sits in a chair, then he interviews people. So you could do all these people, but that's burning up a lot of voices and a lot of impression. And this is going to, I don't want to offend anyone here, but I did Dr. Stephen Hawking. Right. And it was the funniest thing I've done for so long, but it was a little bit un PC. So I'd sit in the chair and be Stephen Hawking. And it's quite easy to do Stephen Hawking, especially if you're sitting in a chair. And it, it, I did this, these dreadful parody of a song and i know it was on pc but it was so funny and it, it's it's one of those things that you've got to look for new things new ways of doing i think you know when when you when you talk about these affectionate people that you've worked with and the people that you you've mimicked and taken off you must have a love for these people in the first place like your michael parkinson's and your day member averages because they were all around mm. on tv at that time well, they were, and of course, David Attenborough, he's, what, 94? Yeah, he's a legend, he's legend. legend. Dad. And I've never met him, and we were talking about who would you love to meet around a dinner table, and my, my you know, my half a dozen people certainly would be Hawking, because I love astronomy and interested in science and stuff. Yeah. David Attenborough, I'd love to meet. Uh, Anthony Hopkins, who is my favourite actor, I think he's wonderful. Yeah. And then there'd be, and then there'd be Robin Williams, sadly. Robin is no longer oh. with us. I, I did meet him, though. I, I got to meet him. Did you? Well, could you, tell us a bit, could you tell us a bit about that, how that came about? Well, it was wonderful, actually, because uh, Robin Williams was my hero through comedy. And uh, Freddie, I suppose Freddie Starr in this country, as I said, is probably the funniest movie I've ever seen. And But I always loved Robin Williams. He came over and did a show through Vince's Trust. And Peter Kay and a few other comedians had bought tickets. So tickets were about 150 quid a night. But we went along and we... We watched this man come out, and I was the only person in, at that time that, that had done Robin Williams. Yeah, I used to do, uh, hey everybody, it's me, Robin Williams. Woo, down the savvy, don't be frightened. And I, I really, <laughs> yeah, I always used to become Robin Williams. I loved Robin. And he came over and did the show, and then he came back afterwards into the bar, met and did a grip and grin, and came around and said hello to everyone. And I've got the most wonderful picture of me and Peter Kay and Robin Williams together. And uh, to meet him was just one of the big thrills of my life, and I think he was one of the great comics of the world. That's 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 absolutely amazing, and the fact that that you you really respected the guy. So I always mm. think if you meet people that you you genuinely do like, you've either watched them on the TV or listened to their music, or you know you've just built mm. up some kind of knowledge of that person to meet them, and they tick all the boxes. Must be good. Now, shall I tell you which is which is so wonderful? Yeah. In, in life, there's a lot of. Um, I've got a lovely... My daughter's doing a gap year. She's over in, in Thailand at the moment. She sent me a beautiful uh, verse, and it was and it was this. She just, she just saw it on a piece of... Um, it was written on a sheet, and it was basically, um, we all come into the earth, we're all born, coming in crying, aren't we? And everyone's standing around, and they're all smiling. And you've got to live a life that when you die, you leave the world smiling, and everyone around the bed watching you is crying. And I thought that is one of the nicest sort of bits of sentiment. Well, and I've gonna... always believed, I'm not a religious man, Chris, but you know, I. I think if you, I believe in the universe, and, and if you believe in something uh, strong enough, it will come to you. And actually, for me, how lucky I am, because everything I ever wanted 
in my life that I really, really, really wanted, I thought about and I really desired, has come to me. I've been so blessed. Um, I've got a question. Let's ask this question at this stage now. This is from Matthew. Uh, now, he's in Manchester listening to the show tonight. And uh, I kind of go... I, I, well, I kind, I kind of go with him on this question. Um, the state of today's television, especially on a Saturday night now, is knackered. Um, what do? You, what is your your view on current Saturday night television? Because it seems, apart from X Factor, maybe okay. Put Britain's Got Talent to one side, maybe. Why Saturday night TV so knackered? Where's the big breaks? Where's your show? Where's House Party? Where well, is all this all, stuff? It all has. It all has. A, 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 it all has um, a life. It all has a period of time that it's uh, the, the, the shows now that. You couldn't do them now. My, my shows work with broken, um, broken comedy shows, sketch shows, uh, with music and entertainment. They still exist, but it's not... Um, it's something that has gone out of fashion. And they make... The comedians now that everyone is seeing on TV are young comedians for young, a young audience. But actually, youngsters, they're not in anymore. They, they go out on a Saturday night. So really, what I, I think... They should stick um, entertainers on for the older audiences. And that sounds like, oh, you're about to say that because I'm talking about No, 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 no. I, I, what you've said there is absolutely spot on. And, and I, I want to say to you, I agree with everything that you're saying. I think, I think like you said, there a lot of the kids, they're on smartphones, they're off out, you know, and th all these things are going on. What I'm saying to you is, you, you know, you're going about, well, things are kind of out of touch, you know, things move on. Who's saying that? Because you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just kind of sliding away into this radio station. We treat well. You really have to look at. I mean, there's some fantastic young community. Look at people. You know, people like um, Michael McIntyre is really good. I like him. He's really good. And he's, good. he's a great entertainer. The show's great. He's a professional. He looks great. Yeah. Very likable. Yeah. Graham Norton again, brilliant. There are shows out there, and Graham Norton. Um, you know, the Michael McIntyre show is not offensive. It's there's no bad language in it when you watch it. Yeah. You know, but when you're watching, and I'm a big fan of, and he's a lovely fella, um, uh, Keith Lemon, and he, he's, he's, he's such a nice fella. But really what he can get away with is pretty outrageous. It's, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do that kind of stuff uh, early on. It's, it's very difficult to entertain uh, family audiences, to be something for everybody. And most comedians now, nearly all of them, are, 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 are adult, aren't they, really? Well, okay. I mean, I, I love you to death, Bobby. I'm going to be honest now. I'm saying it live on the radio. I love you to death. I've, I've followed your career totally. Let's say, let's say, for I, I asked this question to to somebody else who I will name nameless. Um, somebody came over to you now and said, right, Bobby, here's the keys to ITV for the next month. Uh, do what you want with it. What what would you do to return variety to TV, bringing back some of our regular... I mean, listen, I'm of a certain age, so kind of, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit biased. I gave you the keys to ITV. What would you do with them? That's a very, very good question, actually, Chris, because it's, <laughs> I would do nostalgia. I yes, think yes. One, one, of the, one of the things, I mean, I do a whole routine in my show, and I go, um, all these modern comics, they should bring back comedians. I do a whole routine. I say, you know, people, people like me can't get on unless you can wood stain the floor, bake a cake, or dig your garden up. And I can't dance, I can't cook, I can't skate, I haven't got a garden, I've got nothing in the attic. So what chance do I stand? stand? And actually, if, if I, and then I talk about the shows I've been on since, you know, for the last 20 years, no reality shows. Um, I find that, that what, what I think is good is when I see something like, which is popular, something like Jane McDonald. Now, Jane McDonald is, is a, a real punter's term. A real, she's popular with the punters, you know, the over 50s. They, they like it. They like nostalgia. It's great to see nostalgia. We don't get much nostalgia on television anymore. They sort of disregarded, they just put all the modern comedians in. And I do a whole routine now called Still Alive at the Apollo. Let me go, I'm going I'm I'm to really, I do, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, Bobby, I'm going to really shock you. I'm going to shock you now. Yes. I know people that do this, and you're going to find me very weird, but that's, that's okay. I'm, I'm a weird kind of person. I have never watched live Saturday night TV in about two and a half years. What I have... And this is going to sound really weird, so I apologise. I have <laughs> copycats that I watch first at 5.30. And I do all this, I stream all this, by the way. Because the stream is... Like, on there. You can't, you can't stream stuff that isn't on anymore. I can stream mm. what I like. 
I can stream it. I've watched copycats. I've watched the sketch pad with you. I've then watched Big Break. I've then watched the nostalgic episode of Noel's House Party. Uh, early Parkinson. I've created my own Saturday night television now because people like you aren't on it. And the people that are on there now, it's kind of, to me, drivel. Well, it's a bit... This is the thing. I'm going to tell you something. That I was on an aeroplane flying out to Portugal. Changed my life this moment. I was doing the Bobby Robson, I did it every year, the cabaret and the, the entertainment for the Bobby Robson Foundation over yes. in Portugal. And um, I was on there with all the fo- footballers, all the, all the lovely, um, like the, the, uh, the, um, all the old Alan Brazil and Martin Chivers and Harry Redknapp. Oh, you yeah, know, Harry Redknapp, you know, he knows that. And uh, I'm <laughs> talking a few impressions voice. So I'm going over there and we're having a great time. And we're, we're all enjoying ourselves. We're all sort of had a few drinks and we're all laughing and I went to the toilet on the airplane and I did the old opening the toilet door hit my foot pretending it was my nose you know got a laugh went in had my wee and I stuck the toilet paper down the back of my trousers like I I caught the <laughs> toilet paper and as I pulled I came out the door I walked down the aisle okay and it's a visual funny visual thing with all the mates and people were laughing and this woman stopped me she said that's not funny I said I'm sorry she said that's not funny I don't think you're funny I said, well, my friends are finding it funny. She said, well, I don't think you're funny. And I looked at her, and this is what I said to her. <coughs> I said, well, I don't think you're attractive. <laughs> but it doesn't, mean to, it doesn't mean to say somebody does. I'm sure you'll be married to a nice man. You think you're attractive, but I don't. She said, how offensive. I said, no, it's not offensive. It's just your, it's your taste. And not everybody likes my stuff, but not everybody likes And, and Alan Brazil was sitting right next to us on the other aisle. And I said, see Alan Brazil's shirt. I mean, he looked like, a, he looked like an electronic deck chair. <laughs> Hold the candle, look at the curtains. I'm doing all the thing. Yeah. And I said, do you like your shirt, Alan? He said, of course I do. Love my shirt. I said, and they make, people, make those shirts for people of his taste. Now, I don't want to buy that. You're not my taste. But it doesn't mean it's a bad shirt. Do you understand? And it, that's the thing. It's about taste. And I went to see Les Miserables, which is a wonderful, wonderful um, musical, you know, worldwide super hit. I didn't like it. It didn't mean it was rubbish. It just means it wasn't for me. Yeah, personal choice. It's the same with comedians. Same with, it's the same with everyone. Well, some people now are, are banging up asking me to ask you about your character, Vinnie Monks. Uh, yes. In East End. So, see, this is what I love about you, Bob. You can go from a bit of singing, doing your impressions, you can meet, and then into straight acting. How did the role of East Enders come about, and why did you accept it? Um, I wanted to do some acting. Okay. I, I, I was very friendly with Barbara Windsor. And Barbara and I were together one night. She said, why don't you come on East End? I said, well, you know, I, I said, consider me. She said, I'll put a word in for you, and, and I'll love Barbara forever for this. And, and so she, I, I was on holiday in, in, with my kids and my ex-wife. We were over in Florida, and I got a phone call. Can you come in on Thursday and, and read for a part? I went, yeah, yes. I was in a good place in my life, and I went in and read well, and they gave me this part. And off I went, and... It was a lovely, lovely experience. I was on it for 14 months. The only problem was that the 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 people that <coughs> excuse me, the executive people that run the standard, they at the time they wouldn't let me do corporate work and they wouldn't let me do a pantomime. And they wouldn't let me go off and do shows because I need to earn X amount of pounds to try and pay for my family. My life is set up on an income uh, which I need to make or try and make. Yes. Um, and, and by doing EastEnders, and I don't mean, that, I'm not disrespecting, it was still a nice fee, but I just, they weren't letting me do other stuff. And it was very difficult. And I said to them, I said, look, I'd love to stay on the show. And they said, well, we're going to bring a family in. And they did indeed bring a son in. Yes. And I, I left, I had to leave because I had a contract to do a pantomime. And when I came back, I think the parameter of what, what uh, writers have to know that I'm going to be there, have to know that I'm 100%. Yes. And I, I don't, it, it, worked for, it didn't work for either of us, really. I loved the acting bit, and I didn't particularly like the character of Vinnie Monks. He was a bit um, subservient, he was a bit weak. And I wanted to be a, a bit like um, Shane, you know, a bit, a bit cheeky chappy, you know. But they wanted me sort of to be a little bit under the thumb, of course, Shirley was my girlfriend. And despite me telling jokes about her, which I still do now, um, I was very fond of her, I thought the world of her. She was a lovely lady. And um, it was it was a something that was just that period of time. 
and I, I didn't get killed off, so maybe one day I'll turn up again because I'd love to do but, it again. But you see, but you see, again, you know, I've, I've got people asking different questions. I'm kind to kind to trying to bring them all into one mould if I can. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. coming through. This this is the problem you've got. It's it's not just in in the entertainment world, but in the sports world, the tennis world, especially with Andy Murray. Um, people aren't coming through the doors that are like you. I mean, we, we lost to Bruce Forsyth, of course. There's only going to be one ever Bruce Forsyth. Tarby, uh, Kenny Lynch, the, Chubby Brown, throw him in, Bernard Manning, all in that, you know, whether you love him or hate but, him, Bernard. Chubby couldn't really make television. It wouldn't work for Chubby, yeah. simply because he is so outrageous. You know, he's one of the most creative, wonderful comics. This company, I don't, I, you know, I don't necessarily always agree with the material uh, choice, but, you know, it's, it doesn't take away the fact that he's a bloody good comic. I mean, Bernard Manning always gets that criticism of being a yes. racist, which he was. He was, he, he told racist jokes, or would be deemed racist now, but he's still technically a wonderful comic. I mean, look at Jimmy Carr, yeah. who, uh, who is a wonderful comic. Um, you know, I can't believe that he can get away with some of the stuff he says. It's all. It's. It doesn't make you a bad comic if you're, you're a blue comic, um, but as an entertainer, you're, now this is the thing. There's not anyone around that that can sing, really. That they're using that sings, tell jokes, can interact with people that can um, compare and do a game. So they're not using those people. It's not about that anymore. It's not about talent anymore, Chris. It's about. Um, it's about image. It's about persona, isn't it? Because, I had I had a friend of yours uh, on my show. In fact, he's been on twice because he loves it on here. Duncan Norvell. I love Duncan. Uh, yeah. No, Don Don Carunis, as I call him. He keeps calling me love when he calls me love, love all the time, love. I asked him last week if he could share a stage with four comics, past or present. What four would he pick and why? So I want to ask you, the, the king of comedy, Bobby Davro, if you were setting one night up that was going to be a night of laughter and fun. You had to share the stage with four other people, past or present. Who would you pick, Bobby, and why? Who, who, who do you think? Well, I mean, there's so many to choose from. But if you go, this is your, era, this is your choice, if, yours. At the best, at, when he was well and he was at his best, there's only one person who was funnier than anybody I've ever seen, and that was Freddie Starr. Oh, Freddie Starr. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that, that's Freddie a good choice. The funniest, funniest, funniest man I've ever seen. If I look back, Robin Williams I've put on there because uh, I'm obviously a fan of his. Not everything would work in this country because he was American, but he was still genius. Do you know, there's some, you know what I thought about our era? I was talking to my girlfriend about this. Yeah. And my girlfriend is the daughter of one of the Beverly sisters, um, who, and, and they were a wonderful singing group. And, you know, get then I was watching the Brits, and everyone was sort of miming, a lot of them were miming. Yeah. And... Yeah, the, the Beverly Sisters loved them. They were their harmony group, and they sung everything live. Uh, and we were talking about this, and Cannon, the acts like Cannon and Bull yeah. were at the top. When they were at the top, they were beyond magical. People like people like Frankie Vaughan, for instance. I worked in the season with Frankie Vaughan. He told me how to take a, a round of applause and take a bow. And it's a piece of stagecraft. And stagecraft... He's not being passed on to youngsters anymore. They don't... You go and see a comedy club, everyone comes on in there, it's scruffy clothes, and they go, my name's been so-and-so, thank you and good night. Uh, whereas my era, finish on a song and work the stage, use stagecraft, and stagecraft was the... is something that has died. Thank you for... It's a choreographed piece of stagecraft, and I can get standing ovation by using that, that craft. It's... It's incredible, and I love passing it on to people. Uh, Diana, <laughs> Diana in Skegness. Good evening, Bobby. You sound very well. Loving your work. Uh, <laughs> what's your thoughts on another uh, old flame of TV, Russ Abbott? Well, Russ is, if you look at Russ's show, again, he's never celebrated Russ, and he did 20 years of wonderful family entertainment without filthy jokes, just funny. He, he was a wonderful television performer. Wonderful. No one ever talks about him now. Do you, yeah, he was at the top. I mean, he still holds the records, I think, for the most. Do you do you, do you do you think do you think do you think Bob? Be, be, before we talk about Big Brother, do you think Bob that there's too many TV channels now, too much choice? Well, of course, it's all um, diluted. I, I despair when I I was shit. I need to go back a few years now. Been on as a I can't believe that we're watching 
things like Naked Attraction. Oh, that we're watching, God. That we're watching the, um, the Undateables, for instance. Now, it's, I don't keep on, I don't offend anyone here. It's lovely to see people that uh, have handicaps who are finding love and going, but I find that it's put on there not for that reason, people to go, oh, isn't that lovely? He's on there to exploit people. Oh. It's, voy- it's voyeurism to the extreme. And I don't like it. And I, even with something like um, Susan Boyle, you know, Susan Boyle, we all know Susan suffers from uh, Asperger's. Yes. And, it, it's, and it's, it's like the, the problem with comedy now, and I think the whole, generally the whole of the, 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 the country, the whole of the world, is being, we're being dictated by the minority, not the majority, by the, P, the PC world, you know. And I don't think it's necessarily a good thing. I, I, there's nothing that you've said that I don't agree with. Nothing at all. Um, you look, you look at TV now. Um, there, there's chances now that uh, they are starting to delve in. Uh, what, what's your, what's your thoughts? Uh, what's your thought? This is, this is from Ken in Rugeley tonight. What's your thoughts on, um, on programs being bought back, kind of reinvented? Uh, you know, would you like to see somebody reinvent what you did back in the eighties in a different kind of sketch show? We're talking about things like Magnum PI has been bought back with new actors. Uh, yeah. The I tell, I, I tell you, I'm writing at the minute. I'm helping Stephen Malhern. I'm writing some stuff. His live show. Okay. And in, in turn, he's helping me. He's a lovely, lovely bloke. He's a good yes. mate of mine. We're trying to write some material, and I've been, I was at it for about three hours last night writing some lines, trying to give him a, a little bit of something different that he wants to use. Um, and he's talking about uh, game shows and stuff. Yes. And there's so many formats there. I would love to do, for instance, I'd love to do Play Your Cards Right. I'd love to do that show. But there's other shows like Strike It Lucky that, that aren't being done now, you know. Uh, what other shows I could, I, I, I've, I've always seen you doing something like the Generation Game. I think that would be good after the mm-hmm. disaster of what they've just done with it. Uh, because, it, the, you know, I'm, I'm pleased... But they don't use entertainers. They, no. They use, no. They use two presenters who are very, very good men who are excellent, but they're not entertainers. And no. that show requires an entertainer of the skill of Bruce or Jim Davison. You know, Jim gets a hard a hard knock a lot because of his, his um, political stance and his, yeah. his material. Boy, that man I've known for 40 years, he's one of the finest comedians yeah. I've ever seen. I think he's a wonderful comedian. Well, he's he's on my Saturday night schedule, big break, yeah, with Mr. Virgo. He's exactly right, and so he should be. Uh, uh, again, again, you know, the modern comics are the same. Oh, there's comics I like and the comics I don't get. You know, like Noel Fielding, who, who is a very obscure kind of comic. Yes, yes. It, um, it, I don't understand it. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's it's not for me. Well, I've got, I've got, I've got somebody that's come up on my on my screen to my left hand side. I'm going to drop him in for a mention now, because you all know who this gentleman is, Mike Holloway. Oh, I love Mikey. Nice boy. Um, he's listening to your show right now. Obviously, he does a show on here on a Sunday. Uh, and he's agreeing with everything that you're saying right now about you know the fact that uh, people just don't want uh, variety anymore. Um, and uh, mm-hmm. of course, Mike. They Mike's, do. Yeah, they Mike's do on want the money. variety. That's the limit. Punters do want variety, but they're given variety care of things like X Factor and Britain's Got Talent. They're not. There's a line I use in my show. I say it used to be the case that the, the general public would sit on a sofa and watch professional entertainers on television do their stuff. Now it's the professional entertainers sitting on the sofas watching the amateurs and the general public performing, and that is tough to 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 cope with because we need. I need. Um, outlets to show what I can do as a performer, not not cooking shows and skating and dancing no. things I don't do very well. Camping I've just done. Show me performing, and then you'll realise that actually what we do is is very valid and still I'd like to say without turning big or anything, it is very entertaining. It's very good. Well, I, I laugh, I, I laugh non-stop at all. The, I mean, some of the some of the things you even got away got got away with back in the day. Uh, was amazing, but you know what really annoys me, Bob, is that people think because you're not on the TV anymore, you haven't yeah. got a hit record anymore, you're not in the public eye anymore. That people think you've gone away. I'll give you a perfect example. Good friends of mine, right? Said Fred, uh, Richard yeah. Fairbrass, and and Fred. Uh, we yeah. promote them all the time on this station because people laughably think uh, they've gone and they haven't gone. They're out treading the boards. They're out doing concerts. They're all around the yeah. around the world. I go to festivals and all sorts. I go I go down to. And Butlins to do the 80s festival. And anyone, if you've got any other listeners, they'll know what I, <coughs> I do um, on those shows. And I use video screens, I use pictures, I use 
the material, and, and I do stuff for them. I do all the, in the 80s, I do all the, the, the Madness tributes, I'll do the George Michaels and the Elton's and all those things, but I'll also put some of the modern stuff in. Is well, it, just to show people I'm contemporary. Is it, is, it, yeah. is it a harder slog now, putting yourself out there and doing this country stuff and v- appearing at different places? Is it tougher now than it was when you were in the middle of the limelight back in the 80s? Of course, because I could, I could do tours and people would... Well, I got to fill 2,000 seat theatres when, yeah. when I was on the telly. Now, I can't get... Maybe I can only get about 300 people coming to see me at the most because they don't see what I do. You have to be seen. And unless they stick you on the TV showing you what uh, your trade is, they, they, they don't know what you do. They just know me as a bloke that, that was on a camping show. They know me on, on Big Brother, you mentioned. You know, well, we're, that's not performing. That's just being, using my name as, as to earn a living. Well, we've got we've we, we've got some questions for you, and of course, we're going to talk a bit more about you doing your impressions, of course, because people need to realise because we have our audience base on this station is very much what you're looking for. Because yes, yes. you know we don't we don't really play kid stuff on here. It's all it's like the old radio one used to be in the eighties on here. So we have the mixture of people that have here. You know, the demographic maybe thirty plus upwards that will know who you are. Uh, but I need to ask you a question because I was a little bit worried for you at one point. Uh, you've seen other people appear. Why did you decide to go into Big Brother, knowing what you knew about other people? Got Les Dennis had gone in there, Vanessa Feltz had gone in there. It wasn't really for them. You could tell that on the camera. Did you go in for a profile purpose or just to take some time out away from everything? I went in for money. <laughs> I, said, mm. I like your honesty. I like yeah, your honesty. Really nice. And I was in a great place and no one would upset me because I'm too, I'm used to neurotic women and they'd put me in there with a, with a, a narcissist and, a, and, a, and some, uh, some strange people that damaged people. And it, it is easy for me to cope with because I don't rise to, to arguments. I mean, I can argue with somebody, but if you ever saw the Big Brother thing where I actually listened to Sarah Abraham, love her, she was a narcissist. She'd been extremely damaged as a child. Uh, and, and something happened. And, and, her, and narcissism, which anyone that's listening to this you will know, is they go on the attack, so they'll attack you. It's their way of, of defence. She was beyond horrible because... That was a beautiful looking woman, yeah. And, I, and then when I had a time, and I, I bit my tongue, and I knew my moment would come. And when we did a nomination, I sat there in a very famous piece. But I said, you know, the woman here amongst us who is truly beautiful to look at from the outside, but on the inside, she's the ugliest person I've ever met. And she was, she was ugly and it. it hurt me to say it. And then the famous line was, no amount of stick can discuss the ugliness that hides within this woman. And it was sad because I shouldn't really have said it. It was damaged, you know, well, it, it, and those are the shows, and that's what they want, they want arguments, it makes interesting television. I remember, I remember John McCrick being on one where he refused to even look at the camera until he got drinks. <laughs> um, but they're, they're, they're eccentric people, I'm not really particularly eccentric, listen, I'm not, an, I'm not a perfect man, no one, I could never hold myself, I'm just an entertainer who wants to entertain, um, and I love, I mean, like tonight, I've been rehearsing this, the, the, the things I've got to do in the next few weeks. So I still work at it. And we talk about the universe, and you mentioned about singers and stuff. Um, my best friend in life is, is, is the man that I listened to play uh, his first song in 1971, which was called uh, Nothing Rhymed. And it was Gilbert O'Sullivan, and I fell yeah. in love with his song, yeah. fell in love with his music, fell in love with him, not physically, you know. Uh, but but something about him, and we have become, we've been friends now for 35 years, 30 years at least, and he's the most wonderful performer and the most wonderful songwriter, and now he's getting a renaissance. People are starting to fill theatres again to see him. He's a fantastic writer. This is, he, this... Doesn't get, he doesn't get the chance either. You know, you watch the Brits and you see these, if I may say some of them are just because they're contemporary, great. Yeah. But what about all those other people? The last, the last yeah, time, yeah. the last time I watched the Brit, Sam Fox was hosting it, and we know what happened there. <laughs> that was great, wasn't it? I watched it since. I, I was traumatised. Uh, talking to Bill Gilbert O'Sullivan at the end of this chat tonight, we will be playing alone again from the fantastic Gilbert O'Sullivan. Uh, I've got, to, I'm going to make you a promise now, and uh, this promise. Do you remember? Do you remember the Radio on Road show? Yes, I do. How big the Radio on Road show was, and all these people turned up live from Western <laughs> Supermare. Uh, that's next on my hit list. We'll be doing that, and you'll be booked on it. 
No, I'd love to come along. You know, uh, it's and I never, I never stop. Um, for something in the pantomime we did this year, uh, I saw the wonderful. We mentioned his name earlier, Gary Wilmot. Yes, I saw him do the pantomime that he played in last year, and he did uh, a version of the Can Can. You know, um, Bizet's Can Can, and he named all the all the tube stations of London. And I thought that's very clever. And I spoke to him afterwards and said that was fantastic. I said. He said, I bet you th- wish you'd thought of it. And I said, I will tomorrow. So it's a laugh, you know. And then I did actually think about it. And then I phoned him up about three days later and I said, listen, I want to do the Can Can. I can't find a better song. Would you be offended if I actually got the idea from you? And and as long as I don't do your theme and, your, and I do all my work on it. He went, not a problem, he said, because it was given to me from somebody else. So I, I spent uh, a week writing all the countries of the world to uh, the music of the Can Can, 192 countries, getting them to rhyme and everything. Hmm. And then it took, took me it took me six months to learn it. And, it, and I ended up using it at Christmas for the, um, for the pantomime. And that's what I'm talking about, how I still graft at it. And I'll do you an example. It starts very slowly, Laos, Israel, Seychelles, Sierra Leone, Greece, and Nadine, yes. Cyprus, Kamala, Barbados, Belarus, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, Thailand, Kenya, Ghana, Cuba, China, Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, Bhutan, Japan, and South Sudan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Oman, Iran, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Chad, and Syria, and Denmark, Peru, and Vietnam. And it goes all the way through to the Can Can. Fabulous. And that, that is what I think is the most important thing, to find originality with what you do. And the impression that I did of Stephen Hawking, love him, and he was a hero of mine. And I took it out simply because I felt as though it was, it was split. It it was one of the best bits of comedy. It wasn't so much the impression of him to ridicule him. The impression of him was fine. It was the movement of the chair, and the fact that the chair would spin round, and eventually, you know, it, 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 that's where you have to think out. It's finding something that's totally original. And comedy is. It can be hurtful. Comedy can be hurtful. Yes. It can be dangerous. Yes. And the great, the great line I took from um, when I saw it, uh, saw it in the something that Ricky Gervais. I'm a big fan of Ricky Gervais. He said, "I'd like a pound for every time I've offended uh, or anyone with my comedy." And then he said, "Hang on a minute. I have got a pound for every time I've offended someone." Isn't that great? It's it's reality though, isn't it? It's realistic. Um, yeah. I've got so many people that are coming through, uh, of course, and I, I love this because everybody loves you here on this station. <laughs> me, personally, it's kind of add to what they're sending me on direct message on Twitter. Ooh, please ask me, yeah. Please you, ask me anything you, like. you, you Can I just say something, Chris? Chris, this, this is another thing which I strive for. Um, I don't know who it was. It was. I think it might have been an artist. It might be a designer. I don't know really who it was that said this. Everybody laughed at me because, this is his phrase, everybody laughed at me because I was different. But I laughed at them because they were all the same. And my, and I think that that's a wonderful thing. Be different. Don't be a sheep. Try it and stand out. You'll never stand out unless you do something that's different. If you want to be like everyone else, you'll just be like everyone else. Try and find something which, even if it's not great, even if it's not, even if it's not the funniest thing in the world or it's not the, the best thing in the world, if you find something that's different, people will see it. Yeah, but see, but see, the, the the other thing as well, the other thing as well is if you look at if you look at people like Duncan Norvell and the health issues that Duncan's having, um, yeah. he's he was on the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, I remember Duncan back in the day, and I never, I will never come on to, even though I own this station, I would never come on and lie to any guests that I have on and say, yes, I've listened, watched all your stuff. Yeah, I, but I genuinely didn't mean it. I've watched all your stuff. Now, look, look, Duncan, now, you know, I'd like to think we've become friends now. We kind of ring each other quite regular. Uh, and you know why? Because I love the man the same way as I love you. And this, this, this next question that's coming is kind of great for me. Talking about profile, you said a few minutes ago that you want to show people what you can do more so than appearing on, in, in skates or cooking or whatever. But one, one thing I did like, to, did like to see, and I've got to be honest, because... It just shows you as you is when you did the five celebs go camping, which I've just watched and I watched every episode, bawling with laughter, seeing your softer side as well as your uh, your normal approach. Mm-hmm. Just just getting those. Just just just, <laughs> <laughs> oh, just just getting those minutes of you kind of reflecting on things and trying to put trying to put tense up badly however you know it was nice to see you back on a prime time show even not not doing what you want to do i know but keeping it oh that's bobby bobby davro you're all right you're like the rocky of the comedy world 
Well, it's nice to be. There was something recently. Someone spray painted my name up in the stone. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Have you, have you heard about this? Yes, I have. Tell me about it. So Les Dennis, yeah, they did it to Les Dennis. He was a very, very, very good friend of mine. I love that man. That man understood. He is me. Les and I are like mirrored, um, mi- mirrored bro- brothers. He, uh, he, he's had his bad years. He's had great years. But someone last year or the year before started spraying his name in Norwich, and it made the press. Then all of a sudden, someone else has come along and started spraying mine up around the, the town of Stoke and, and the city of Newcastle. Um, and my name is up on billboards and in underpasses, apparently. And I said, it's the work of an impressionist painter. Yeah. I, but, uh, uh, I said, I want it to be laid up in lights, but I've only got it up in um, luminous spray paint. But I don't know why they chose us. Why did they chose Les Dennis? Why did they, cho- why did they choose Les Dennis? Why did they choose me? There's a million people to choose. And I can never figure that out. I mean, we're flattered in some ways. But I can't... Is it to ridicule us, or is it... What is it? What do you think? I think... I don't know. I think, I think I'm going to go with what you originally said. Um, some people seem, in my eyes, safer bets than others. Um, I, th- I think, really, we need to campaign to get you back on a show, or, or, or kind of doing content. <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember today with Des and Mel that used to go out at dinner time? Yeah, lovely, lovely. These... these these programmes now have been condensed down. We've lost all these five o'clock shows. We need you on shows where you can showcase what you do because you are, honestly, I mean, I'm, I can't be a bit biased here, I know, because I love Bob. You've got to go and stream some of his stuff on YouTube and look at what we're talking about. No, this guy, no, no, but it's old. It represents something from 25 nobody, years ago. Nobody, but, but he doesn't. Well, no, 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 no. I don't go, if you want to watch Bobby Devereaux, come and see the show live or come and see the things that is, are contemporary that you see, like there's... Someone recorded me at Butlins. Uh, watch a bit of that. That's the sort of comedy that I, I like to do. Uh, watch me in a pantomime. Then you'll see what I do. Not from 25 years ago. It doesn't interest me in going back 25 years ago. But but, um, but for people like us, for people like us, me and our audience, it does interest us because we know exactly what you were doing in those sketches. Yeah, um, but it's too old. It's, it's not relevant. Come and, if, you, if I was on television now, you ask me what I do on Saturday night. They gave me a... Saturday night special. Yes. I wouldn't do. I wouldn't do all the things I did back twenty five years. I'll I'll do all the Michael McIntyre. Of course. Of course. All the things that are relevant now. But then, but then. See somebody like yourself. You sh- you know if if okay if you were ever offered to maybe be a judge on Britain's Got Talent, would you consider that? Because I think you have the right to be in the seat. Well, not really, because my. My profile isn't high enough. It's 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 gone. I can accept that. It's not about. I'm not bitter in any shape or form. I'm the thing that frustrates me is I have nowhere. No one's asked me to do anything creative with my talent, with what I'm good at. I can sing. I can do the impressions. I can tell jokes. I, they're, they're the things that uh, I've I've built up. That I deserve to be put on there. Not to. I think it's. it's I tell you what. It's frustrating. People go blow down. Nasty. They don't even know what we do, but they, we're naff because we are painted out to be naff. And that's the media for you. You know, oh, he's just this man. He's into, he has been. And it, but it's only because we're not on there being seen to be doing what, what would be relevant. And you only have to, to be given a chance. It's like being given a kick of the ball. You could be one of the best footballers on, on, on a team. But if you're stuck on the, on, on the bench, no one's going to see you play. I'm, and I'm waiting to be. I'm waiting to be brought on, if you like. You know, Bobby, you're an exceptional human being. I've loved your work ever since I first saw you back in the eighties, and miss you on the TV. You are absolutely yeah, correct. I miss him on there. And you know, you mentioned Duncan. Do you know what he had? And I'm, I'm, Duncan is a dear friend. Yes. And and obviously he had a stroke. It's been dreadful. He struggles with himself. Uh, but he had something I didn't have in the beginning. I did a summer season up in Blackpool. I was uh, I met a girl dancer, she was lovely, and I did the show. And they, I used to struggle like I was doing impressions of Sting and Max Headroom to, uh, to, uh, to people that were were basically they're they you know, they driving that they're driving this bus as we're in there. They were old people. They were very very old. Yeah, you know, and that old snap when we lost half the audience. Those kind of gags, you know. Seen Haley's comic three times. They're old. They didn't get what I wanted to do. And organ and drums, dreadful. And it was, and I used to go out my house early night, you know, and then I left the scene of a split season, and I went back up to watch Duncan Norvell take over from me. Yes. And that boy came out, he was 
John takes me to the Dougie to, to the best bit. It's about, it's not about his talent. He was talented. Maybe not as talented as maybe I was in different areas. But do you know what he had over me? He had the most wonderful charisma. It was, it was the charisma that that man had was just it oodles of it. And the audience absolutely loved him. And he got a standing ovation the first night he opened. And I sat there and thought, oh, my God, I've just spent it like five weeks going on me. me <laughs> and I watched this boy and he was so charismatic. And that's what, and we had individual acts. The, the acts weren't all just stand up. When you had a stand up comic, it wasn't just, here's another one talking about uh, observational comedy or being in the supermarket or having kids. They had acts, they had music, they had uh, they had a style, they had clothes, and the clothes were different. There were people like Roy J. I don't, you don't remember Roy J? Do you remember Roy J? I do. Roy J came out in a convict suit, spooks, spooks, he's no longer with us, he died, which was very sad. But they had individual um, people like, um, we lost him as well, which was Sludge Lee, Ian Sludge Lee, he's a wonderful comedian from, from, the, the, you know, from the black country. Rampton comic. They had individuality. Now, I think that's fine now. Comics now don't have, they don't stand out for me. They don't stand out enough. Yeah, I, think yeah, that, but, I think that that's what our era had. We had, we had um, something that had a bit of, if you like, smallness to it, the heart to it. I love that. We we, we 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 need to get you back onto TV. That's what we need, Bobby. Uh, we go. Only if I can perform. Go and see, I tell you what was great. I went and I cried, and I'm, I'm not. I I, I I wouldn't speak badly of someone. It's uh, uh, Stephen. Um, what's his name? Um, Steve Coogan. Yes. I met Steve Coogan a long, long time ago. I haven't ever met him since. And he was he was a little bit. Oh, Bobby Dabby, you know, you're from a different era. And again, we did a corporate gig together. But I tell you what, I went to see him in um, in Lauren and Hardy. He's one of the finest, finest uh, films I've seen. He was absolutely fantastic in it. And that's what it's about. A bit of heart, love, and, you know, a bit of um, pathos. Great comics, great comics, like Norman Wisdom, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chapman, all these people, Lauren and Hardy, they all had pathos. Wonderful. You know, this is this is this is why you're this is why during the course of the interview tonight you've been so lovely about other people. I kinda knew you'd be like that, but very respectful of other people around you. Those in the trade, those doing family family shows of course that don't, don't offend people. Uh we I think well, we're not offend people. Don't somebody, somebody, if I'm talking of certain things, I'm I'm capable of I like smutty jokes. I'm a smutty joke comic. Yeah. I I I, I, I use I, I don't use go over the top there's certain words I wouldn't use but I use the F word occasionally and we all um, do. If, it's, if it's right to use but people that have that, that have got I tell jokes I'm not a man all my, my jokes I've got tags to it like the great Bob Monkow yes he was a good friend of mine he taught me the economic of words within a within a, uh, a joke oh god I can do it now it's like oh can I have a word I said what is it um, well, you're using too many jokes for good that There's something that we always there's something that we always do here on 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 the station. Of course, Duncan was last week. Your turn tonight. Uh, one or two yeah. people, of course, who are persuaded because we have uh, on this station we have live chat rooms where people can chat live, as in I yeah. can see them on the screens. Uh, and of course, uh, you're going to make their evening now. There's one or two people I want you to uh, do a shout out to. Yeah. A big fans of yours, uh, so you'll enjoy yeah. you'll enjoy this couple of minutes. I want you to say a big hello to Mandy P. Mandy P. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not um, a request, is it? No, no. It's just a so shout got, out. Uh, got cystitis or anything like that. <laughs> it's just a shout out, Mandy Bob. P. 
But you only say hello to him, just say hello to him. Yeah, so you say hello to Mandy P from Bobby Dabro. Um, well, we've got a great speaking to you on, uh, on, on Chris's radio show, uh, and I'm going out to Mandy P. I do wish you well, have a wonderful year, and I uh, hope your problem clears up for so. We're then going to bounce over. To, <laughs> we're, then, <laughs> we're then going to bounce over to Wales, where you'll say hello to Ruby Logan. Hello, Ruby. Yes, Bobby Dabro here. I hope you're well. Well, don't know, do me a favour. You know, say hello to Owen Mummy, who is a big friend of mine and he's very peculiar and everything. Well, you never know then. I think that way. That's fantastic. We're now moving to Plymouth, where I'd like you to say hello to Andy Bruce. Uh, good day, Andy. This is Bobby Dabro speaking to you, mate. Uh, good day, I can't. I don't know how they speak in Plymouth. Uh, maybe it's a bit like that. Is it a bit like that? I don't know. I can't. I, I get a bit confused. We're moving into the jet roll. Oh, I like what you do. You have very like that way down here now, isn't it? Aye. No, uh, wait, I don't know if that's Plymouth. I don't know. I've spent every pantomime. I've, I've done about six <laughs> pantomimes in Plymouth. Let's see how you get on with this one. Uh, we're going to no. the black country. The black country. Can you say hello to Maxine and Ray? Hello, Maxine and Ray. All the work is smooth. But we have a lot of from the back, from, uh, you know. And uh, I'll give it a go. She's my girlfriend. Her father was Billy uh, Knight, the, uh, the great football that played for all the ranks in one of us. So there you go. It's got a statue outside of Molyneux. And when we go past Molyneux, we always have to stop and run Billy Wright statues later. So that's uh, my connection with Wolverhampton Wanderers. So nice to, uh, to say hello to you in the Black Country. Now we're going to go thousands of miles away now. Thousands of miles. We're heading to South Australia. And, now, I've, I've never said this right on my show yet, but I'm going to attempt it for you, Bob. Her name is Vahula. Vahula. It is. And Hello, she... that was a me. It's probably that being an impression of that. Good day, lovely folks. It's me, um, Vahula. That's a great name, Vahula. It was like something, you know, like cheesy biscuit or something, you know, Vahula <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've got one of my dearest friends is in Australia, um, and he plays the character Alf in Home and Away. His name is Ray Marr, and uh, I, it's one of the people that actually I have a, a love for, um, and I don't get to see him very much, but uh, Australia, debate yeah, stick an ice cream on the barbie. Off to London we go now, and London, Mr Mike Holloway. Well, Mikey, I know you know me, and um, we chatted not that long ago. I hope you're well. You're still as handsome as ever. Gosh, you are handsome. Uh, I remember seeing you on a tube train, looking as handsome as ever. And um, I hope you're well. We did say we'd get together soon. You know my telephone number. Ring me. I'm going out, out, not out, out, out. We're not going out, out. out. Right, now out, I, out. I, will, I will be killed on the spot if you don't do a shout out because you know this person and I know he's listening in right now. Can you say mm. hello to Tony with a twist of lemon? So, who listens to radio show like this? Chipping! Uh, hello, Tony. It's, it's Davro here. I hope you're well. Um, we've talking about people that I really like, and you are, are one of those folk. You are a really good bloke, and uh, and I wish you well with everything. Give, give me a call. I'll always do something for you. You always turn up, and you always support me, and uh, you're generally a lot nice. Well, hopefully, we'll be doing that as a station for you from now on, Bob. Uh, can yeah. you also say hello to Laura, who's listening in? Tell Laura I love her. Tell Laura, Tell Laura I need her. her. That's, that's, that's real, real right, we're, Hello, moving, Laura. we're moving to Edgebaston in the West Midlands and Christopher Ashford. Yes, we're going to move to the bush because uh, talking to someone that did it. So I can't remember the name of the uh, the uh, cricket bloke, but there you go. Um, I don't follow cricket. It's at the England and in India. If you can't get the runs in India, you can't get them anywhere. That's an old joke. Now to America, we go to America, and listening to your dulcet tones live, live from America, with Linda Loftin. You know, Linda, it's fantastic to speak to you. I'm doing Donald Trump. I'm an English with doing Donald Trump. I hope I don't offend you because, you know, I'm a great fan of your great country. We're going to build a wall. It's going to be amazing. Wow. That is amazing, Bob. <laughs> uh, next up, uh, good pals of yours, Sam Kane and Linda Lusardi. Sam Kane, all I can say, Sam, is it's very lucky you met someone with that eyesight. My goodness. <laughs> Linda, you should have gone to Specsavers, love. <laughs> um, oh. Sam, you made me laugh so much last night or the night before last. Uh, I'm doing all the, all the jokes that you told me about, Gemma Collins. They're the best, <laughs> the best jokes that I've heard for about a month. 
We laughed and we laughed because listening to a fan been a friend of mine for years. And he's the best gay radio presenter I, I've ever worked with. I'm only joking, he's not the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll go down well. Uh, big hello to Joe Walkden. Walkden. Joe Walkden. Oh, so, right. Is it Joe? It's not just Tate of Scotland, right? I'm a Dinastin. Joe Walkden. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to talk to you. <laughs> Now, somebody who lives in a place called uh, Kings Norton, they haven't done anything wrong, they just have to live there, uh, is Harold and Louise. How are you? Harold and Louise. And Louise. Harold! Harold! I'm off to seven to Louise. That's a really old impression. Oh, I love it. So see, see Steptoe and Son again? You've got me there. I used to love Steptoe and Son. Just, and just. I, 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 I like, oh, Harold, don't believe me, Harold. Please don't believe how so I used to love that. That is just amazing. Absolutely you know what amazing. I used to do that no one ever did. I, I used to do the lightning lads. Yes. Yes. You know like yes. Yeah, I used to do run reviews. I used to run reviews. used to see like that. Hello. Oh, oh, run reviews. Oh, I'm to get the talk now. Run reviews. used to like yeah, I'm going to live on the, on the Ellsworth housing estate. And, and, I'll tell you a great story. It was James Bowman was in it, and I was doing a play in London, and he was sitting opposite in the sleep in the chair in the chair opposite me, and I sat next to him. I woke him up and said, "Could you test me on the script?" "With what?" I said, "This. I'm doing the. I'm doing um, one run for your wife. And you did it, and I saw you at the Criterion do it. What? He didn't know who I was, and I said, "Just would you do lines?" He fell back to sleep, and I was telling him. And then I woke him up again. And I went, "Do they have nasty spiders in Guatemala?" He said, "What?" <laughs> I said. It was a line from the from the Lightly Lads in nineteen ten. He just got up and walked away. <laughs> oh, just amazing! I was a huge fan of his. You might, you might, you might me scream. So, listen, what's next for Bobby Davro? What's next? Well, I'm not doing an awful lot of work. I'm doing a pantomime, right? Another pantomime. He's uh, seen the DJ's all the time. Um, I'm doing a pantomime uh, at Easter, and we're going all over the country. Where are you based, Chris? We are in Bur- well, no, we're in the UK. I'm in Edgebaston right now, but we broadcast around the UK. Okay, uh, well, I'm coming up that way. I'm coming up. Uh, I'll tell you where I'm coming up. I shall tell you. Uh, I'm coming up to um, uh, Salford, Salford, yeah. Antax, Wrexham, Carlisle, Hull, Stock, Stoke, Hastings, Bournemouth, Weymouth, Plymouth. I'm coming up that all that place, Mansfield, Skeggy. Skegness. Kings Lynn, is that near you? Yeah, uh, only, anywhere's near me, Bob. It's called Train or Car. Ah, that's the one. I haven't got my car soon. I've been banned. Well, I'm about to be banned for speeding. I've, got, I've racked up loads of points. No way. I don't know. Well, I, I oh. do. I do know. I do know a couple of decent magistrates that can, you know, take <laughs> take care of that. Yeah, you know, I've got a few. Um, I've got a, 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 somebody, but I think it will pay me to. I've got fifteen points. There you go. I've never shared that with anyone. I've got fifteen points on my license, and I've got to go to court in Guildford, and I'm going to. Um, I'm going to actually have six months. But li- but you know but but listen listen on 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 the on the plus side on the plus side um, mm. you've known you've known Tony with a twist of lemon for a while now <clears throat> now obviously yeah, you're now you're talking to the boss of the station tonight and I say this and Duncan Norvell has taken me up on this use mm. the station be involved with us getting you know be able- no I mean I'd love to I'll come in and do a little bit with you I'd like you know what it would be a bad idea to do a little show or something. Yes, well, well, it's surprising you say that because uh, that's what we're doing with Duncan Norfell as well. <laughs> well Duncan, Duncan and I go back. I used to do, and it's something to do. That man is such a lovely fellow. He's got a great woman behind him. And he's, um, he's so talented that he can, he, he, he's a great gag smith. He's, we, we swap gags all the time. Obviously, through what happens with him, with the stroke and everything, it's made it difficult for him. But he'll tell you we did a show, a tribute show, and the audience, as I mentioned before, the charisma of that man, he came out and he sat there, we helped him out and he sat there and he got out of his wheelchair because he, he struggles to walk, you know. And he did about 20 minutes of stand-up jokes. The audience gave him a standing ovation. He sat back down in the chair and we, we took him off in the chair. And then when everyone was cheering and gave him that standing ovation, I pushed him back on. 
and everybody took his bow. And then just as a laugh, I actually turned the chair around and pushed him up right against the back of the stage when I never really liked him and just yeah. left him there. <laughs> it was so funny. But, but you know... <laughs> you know but but you know, you know he was the original. You know he was the original choice for doing Blind Date. Yes, yeah, we've we've spoke about that. Then see what what's happened is is I've I've gone into a few of Duncan's things now, and I'm running his group page yeah. on Facebook, and I've re-edited HD videos and put them up, um, and and I'm kind of a master of all trades. But I think on one video I, I lumped up, it only been up there a day, five thousand views on that immediately. Um, um, so so don't, don't I, the, the thing is with me, if I like somebody and I think they're genuine. I will go above and beyond if I think they're genuine people. I mean, a good friend of yours was on a couple of weeks ago. Cheryl Baker was on the show. Uh, and she's just everything that I thought she would be as well. Fantastic human being. I've got people now uh, tweeting me on DM, give Bobby a show, get Bobby on his own show. Uh, the, the, the same thing as I say, you know, we've got the wonderful Mike Holloway on the station, of course, who's, uh, you know, bought his own his own stamp. He's got all his own. You see, this is the beauty of it, of course. Uh, back in the day of Flintlock, Minder, uh, Tomorrow People, all the things Mike Holloway was involved in. This is the point. All these fans... He's so good looking, isn't he? I hate him. He's so good looking, but... Well, he's not. He's, don't don't swell his head. But all these fans that used to watch him are now in his live chat room on a Sunday night when he does his show. So he's literally grabbed all his followers, uh, talking about the blast from the past that have now come back, uh, that tune into his radio show on a Sunday and get involved with that sort of thing. The same with Sam Kane, of course. He comes on. He Gary Bushel, somebody else, you know, who who kind of comes on this station, does his hour, has a great bit of fun, and that's what it's all about. So I'm saying to you, Bobby, live on the radio. Everybody can hear me at 2211. There's a show available for the future if you want it as a profile gimmick. You can come on, do your gags, play some music, play your Gilbert and Sullivan, have a good time. Well, let me tell you something. As we said before, we're leaving this. Nostalgia, it's wonderful. People like to look back. People like to remember those precious moments, those, those things that we laughed at, those songs that we listened to. Bring them back. There's a big market out there that wants it. Yeah, they really want it, and I know they do. People, people want nostalgia. Yeah, but, they, it, but, 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 but comedy, it, whether it's music. It all, it all, it all, it all, it all proves. It all proves the point when you have people like Angie Brown and Mike Holloway and Tony and Gary. They all spend a lot of time putting their shows together. And I have to say to you, Mike Holloway does his show non gratis, so he doesn't get paid fees to do it. But because of all his acting experience, music experience, working with people, he records his songs, he puts them out on his show, people come to his show, then he can promote what he's doing in the theatres or if there's any TV work coming up. It's like a rolling. And these guys, this is why I love these people. They come on here, help me achieve what I need to achieve after 10 years, you know, a million listener station. And this is what it's all about. And people like yourself, Bob, I'm surrounding myself, literally, I've got to be honest with you, with all my fans from the past. All, my, all the people, I want, I'm surrounding myself with all these people now. I don't want no outsiders. I don't want no Michael McIntyre's or Anton Deck. I want the real entertainers around me. That's what I want. You know, I always speak, my father always says, if you haven't got anything nice to say about someone, don't say it. And speak, always speak as you find. Yes. And, uh, they, and honestly, some of the, the youngsters' comics, they are, they're, they're doing what they're doing and it's valid now because it's, it's what's needed now. It's what's wanted now. Uh, and, but actually, when I go and do comedy clubs, which I do, yes. people go, my gosh, that material you've got, it's so funny, you know, and they, but actually it's 30 years old, some of it. Well, we can well, make it, we, you know, funny and funny. We can, moving forward, as a stopgap for you, if you'd ever like to, uh, you know, the good thing about doing a show on this station, you don't have to leave home, you don't have to travel anywhere, um, we've got people all around the country doing shows from Plymouth to London, but all over the place. You uh, don't have to have a studio or something. With a, like no, a, no. A you need you need a computer, you need your impressions, and you need a microphone, and then I take care of everything else for you. Oh, I've got it all, love. Got it all. There we are, my love. There we are, my love. Well, listen, uh, it's quarter to 11. We've been talking for, non-stop for the first time ever, one hour and 15 minutes solid live on the show. And uh, I've run out of time, Bob. Well, Chris, it's been an honour and a pleasure talking to you. Play me, alone again naturally, because he, to me, Gilbert O'Sullivan is my, his music has been the soundtrack to my life. It's and been... he is the loveliest and most, I'm, they're like my family, his, his children and my bridesmaids, his wife and his family have been there for me throughout 30 years, likewise to me, I've just come back from Amsterdam, and he, he's been, he brought me so much joy. And I'd love you to play a song. And 
anyone's listening to this that hasn't actually uh, remembered Gilbert, you go out and buy his new album and buy his music because I tell you what, it's, it's fantastic. Well, we, we've got to do, before we play Gilbert O'Sullivan, which is lined up on the station to play in just a second, uh, we've got to do a bit of a mop up first. You're on Twitter. What's your address on Twitter? Oh, uh, I think it's Bobby Davro 1. It's at Bobby Davro 1. See, I have to have this information ready. Uh, so, at Bobby Davro 1, if you're going to follow him on Twitter. Uh, and, of course, no doubt anything that you're doing will appear on uh, on those feeds moving forward, Bob. You want me to the Davro? I'm working great at the minute. I mean, it's, I'm really enjoying my work. And I've put so much new material into the show. I've got, like, about 20 minutes of new material. And I'm still working on it. I always work at it. And it's never the same show. Well, listen, for you, for, you, for you, because we love you, as soon as you've got the dates together, you've got some kind of literature, get it, me, and we'll get it on the Second City Radio website for you. You're a good fellow, Chris. I oh, know I'm good. I know. Can I introduce Gilbert? Can I introduce him? Yeah, you introduce Gilbert. Before you do, can I just say thank you very much indeed for being on the show tonight, Mr. Bobby Davro, the legend that is. Pleasure. Uh, absolute pleasure. And I'm going to let you introduce alone again from Gilbert Hello Sullivan in your own way. The whole radio station network is now yours. There is a saying in this business that it's nice to be important, but it, I believe it's more important being nice. And the listeners, tonight you have been important. You've all been very, very nice. I hope you've enjoyed what we've been talking about. I'm now going to introduce someone who means the world to me. He's my idol. He is a man who's, as I said just a moment ago, his music has been the uh, soundtrack to my life. One of the greatest songwriters.